It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So my title, the title of my talk is Online Advertisements and Online Algorithms. Online, online advertising, this is what we've been talking all day, so you all should know pretty much what this is about. It's uh, search ads, display ads, ads you see on Facebook, uh, Skype, New York Times, ads on your mobile phone. Second part of my title is online algorithms. Here's a textbook written on online algorithms in 1998. So this uh, faceless, evil-looking guy here uh, is supposed to be the adversary who's uh, making life difficult for this guy walking a tightrope, balancing something on his hand. Uh, this this is an algorithm. And if you see the table of contents of this uh, textbook, it has problems. You know, with names such as these, uh, they, these don't have anything to do with online ads, right? So what's up? What this area studies is decision-making under uncertainty. And that is very relevant to online ads. And uh, what I'll talk today is a modern version of this online algorithms, how this area was influenced, uh, online algorithms, how this area was influenced by online advertising and how it influenced back the practice of online advertising. The story begins in 2007, really, with this uh, paper by uh, Arenek Mehta, Vijay uh, Vazirani, Amin Saberi, and Umesh Vazirani. And I think it, it began with uh, Amin's Google interview where someone asked him this question, I think. Arenek can connect, correct me if I'm wrong. And it was motivated by budget management in search ads. And an important thing that uh, this paper did was they greatly simplified this problem. So this actual problem has so many bells and whistles, it's hard to wrap your head around. And they you know, took out a very clean version of the problem. For instance, um, all the game theoretic aspects were removed, and they converted it into a, a pure optimization problem. And here's a problem that they studied. So there are n advertisers, and each advertiser begins the day with some budget. And queries come one by one during the day. Whenever you get a query, I, you see the bids of the advertisers for that query, and you have to allocate this to one of the advertisers. Okay. So if you allocate the I to A, then you collect BIA from his budget. So as the day progresses, his budget depletes, and once the budget of the advertiser is spent, you cannot collect any more money from him. So you want to maximize the total revenue, which is the total, uh, you know, for every advertiser, you get how much you allocated to him, you collect all of that, but not more than his budget. Why not allocate each query to the highest bidder? Be done with it. Why is, is there a need for an algorithm at all? Uh, it's not very hard to see. Uh, that if you did this, you could get only 50% of what you could have got if you did something else. So there's an easy example that shows this. And in fact, the greedy algorithm always gets at least 50% of the optimum that you could have got if you knew everything ahead of time. And this paper gave a very beautiful algorithm, a very natural algorithm called the balance algorithm, which is a very elegant analysis. What the algorithm does is, okay, pretend this is not there. What the algorithm does is, it balances the bid and the remaining budget using a discount factor. And it assigns the query to the highest discounted bidder. The discount is calculated as a function of the unspent fraction of the budget at that time for the advertiser using this formula. So. What is this formula? It's e to the minus x. It looks like this. So think of this alpha. When you start, the unspent fraction is 1. So you start at 1 over e. And as you deplete your budget and your unspent fraction goes to 0, it goes all the way up to 1. And so this, the discount factor is this. It's, uh, now you think of it as you start here. When you start, the discount factor is high. So your bid is relatively high. So you're favored. You start at 1 minus 1 over e. And by the time your budget is exhausted, this discount factor has gone to zero. So once your budget is exhausted, your bid is zero. So you're not getting any more uh, queries. 
it's a very nice natural algorithm and uh, they showed a worst case performance guarantee so this is with no assumption on the input okay and what they showed is that you always get at least a 1 minus 1 over e fraction of whatever else you could have got if you knew everything ahead of time uh, this is about 63% so greedy got half they get 63% uh, so it's a it's an improvement and this is called the competitive ratio and moreover this is tight so there is no algorithm that gets anything better in terms of competitive ratio they did make one assumption that uh, the only assumption they made was the bid to budget ratio was small so each bid was relatively small compared to the total budget of the advertiser and this is a reasonable assumption in the in the example of search ads for instance so this is a very nice uh, story you know you have a natural problem and you have the optimal algorithm for it um, you know it's uh, it's 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 very beautiful and this started the whole area of uh, this online algorithms and the online advertisements around the same time there was essentially the same algorithm was given by uh, bookbinder uh, kamal jain who's here and uh, now it was the same algorithm the difference was they gave a primal dual interpretation of this algorithm so here's an lp relaxation for the problem and here it's is its dual don't be intimidated by all these equations i uh, just wanted to focus on the dual and these constraints in the dual so there are variables for every query beta i is a variable for the query and there are variables for every uh, advertiser so these are alpha a's and there's a constraint for every pair and it looks like this let me rewrite it you know that makes it easier to follow and let me focus let me fix an i and look at this constraint for all a so it looks like this and essentially what it says is the beta i must be at least some maximum of all advertisers this bi a times one minus alpha a and we are trying to minimize beta i so you, you know might as well set beta i to be equal to this if you were solving this dual and this should look familiar to the algorithm that i just showed in the previous slide and in fact the algorithm the allocation rule comes from the complementary slackness conditions of this lp complementary slackness condition says if xi a is bigger than 0 so now xi a is a indicator variable whether you allocate i to a or not so if you allocated i to a in the optimal solution then beta i must be equal to this and since this was a beta i was a maximum the the a that you allocated must be the arg max and this is where this allocation rule comes from and uh, so there's a reason why i wrote the previous algorithm in this way and because i had the benefit of foresight so this this shows what foresight can buy you <laughs> so it's essentially the same algorithm the same uh, formula to set the dual variables Uh, the analysis is different it's a primal dual analysis so you just you know whenever you get something in the revenue you just charge it to the dual with a factor of 1 minus 1 over e and that shows you this uh, this is a 1 minus 1 over e competitive algorithm it's a very nice proof so you know once again we have these two papers we solve this problem solve it in a very nice way very natural algorithm nice analysis so i understood the previous setup was dynamic right you have to allocate items as they come yeah this where's the dynamics here so this is the, the setup is the same it's the same problem uh and the algorithm is the same this is a motivation for the algorithm and this is this it connects the algorithm to the dual so you change the dual as you go along and you use the dual to do the allocation online and whenever the analysis says okay you know in every step what is the increase in the the primal objective that the algorithm got and the dual also you can show it always increases and just you know show that these two are within a ratio of 1 minus 1 over e but the lp problem is written as if you know all the so, so you don't have to i'm not it's i don't have to know everything ahead of time so for instance i don't have to i only set the beta i variables only when i comes until then i don't have to i'm not solving this lp at once i'm also solving the lp online proof technique okay thanks so you know we have this nice algorithm and and that's it so what do you do next so the thing is the real world instances are not really they don't look like the instances that induce 
this 1 minus 1 over e ratio. So there, is, there are set of instances that, you know, force no algorithm can get better than 1 minus 1 over e. So real world instances don't look like that. And because of that, people started thinking of, okay, what else can we do? How can we show, how can we capture what real world instances look like? And they turned to stochastic models. So for instance, you can assume that the input comes from some distribution, but the algorithm does not know this distribution. Here's an example. It's called the IID model. So there's some distribution over what any one query can look like. And every step, you get an IID sample from this distribution. Another example is the random order model. Here, an adversary still picks the, all the set of queries ahead of time. And then nature shuffles the queries in a random order, uniformly at random. And the order in which they get is a shuffled order. So the algorithm is, sees the queries in a random order. So in my paper with Tom Hayes, we gave this algorithm that works well in such a model of, uh, you know, such a stochastic model. What it does is it takes the first epsilon fraction of the queries and uses this as training data. And what do you train? You learn the optimal duals on this sample. Okay, so you can solve the LP. Now the dual LP restricted to the sample. You can find the dual variables and just use those duals to allocate for the rest of the time. So using the same discounted, highest discounted bidder rule. And the nice thing that we showed was that now the competitive ratio tends to one as the bid to budget ratio tends to zero. So in particular, you get one minus epsilon competitive ratio if the bid to budget ratio is something like epsilon cubed by n log n. So the difference from the worst case is now we don't get stuck at this one minus one over e. Under some benign assumption about the input, you can actually get close to optimal. So any algorithm that gets this kind of a thing that competitive ratio tends to one as some parameter tends to something, uh, we call it asymptotically optimal algorithms. So you can approach you know, the optimal allocation even without knowing what's going to come. You can do better. Why just train this once in the beginning? You can retrain as you get more samples. So this is standard doubling trick. So every time you, know, you use these samples, you train the dual on these, use it for the allocation for these queries. Now you use the dual for everything from the beginning to here for the next set of uh, queries. And then you use everything from here to here for the next set. And this shaves off factor of epsilon in the uh, convergence rate. So you now get epsilon squared by n log n, as shown by Agrawal, Wang, and E. But actually what was more important about this, as was shown in these two papers, is this technique, you can use it to solve a wide class of what are called packing problems, and not just the particular problem that uh, I showed in the beginning. And one particular problem in this uh, class is very closely related to the display ad problem. So you know, we're going to take a detour now and go into the display ad problem. So this is very similar to the problem that I showed before. The main difference is instead of budget constraints, you now have capacity constraints. So every advertiser has a certain number, CA, and you can only uh, get credit for a CA uh, of these impressions that you assign to him. And the rest is the same. So the impressions, now these are called impressions. They come online, you know, you have to allocate to one of them as soon as they come. Right? It's a very similar problem. And now the difference actually here is, this is very close to the actual problem in display ads that a publisher has to solve. So the way display ads work, uh, you know, a majority of that, the majority of the revenue actually comes from this guaranteed delivery where the publisher has made uh, some contracts with advertisers about you know, um, assigning him a certain number of impressions of a certain type using all the targeting that President talked about within a certain time frame. And now he's made these contracts already. Now he has to deliver on this. So he's getting impressions online, and he has all these contracts he's signed, and he's, you know, he's trying to maximize his uh, kind of value from these contracts. And now there's no game theory in this problem. So this problem is actually very close to the actual problem that the uh, display ad you know, system has to solve. 
And the same dual based allocation idea uh, for the stochastic model, you know, just learn the duals from the sample uh, works. So the allocation rule looks slightly different. Here it is an additive factor instead of a multiplicative factor. But essentially the same idea works, you get similar guarantees. And, uh, and uh, you know, you get similar guarantees in the stochastic model, but you know, in the worst case, the guarantees are much worse. Sorry, I just don't understand the capacity setup. So if you have a guaranteed delivery, like you have a certain reach that you have to achieve, I feel like the inequality should go the other way. Like, no, so it's actually an equality. Oh, it just becomes an equality. So it's really yeah, bad. yeah. And also it was at this point that people started really paying attention to these techniques of using the duals and learning the duals from the uh, history and trying to apply it to the displayed uh, problems. Also, this was around the time when I had personally, I had joined Microsoft and you know, I had these results and uh, I was very confident that, okay, look, you know, we have solved this problem. Let's just go tell these guys what to do and you know, it'll be great. Uh, and then this happened. <laughs> so, so actually what happened was not that bad. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we tried out these algorithms. They worked reasonably well, but uh, they didn't do better than whatever algorithm they had, uh, which was, I really don't know what algorithm they had because uh, it was built over years, you know, a uh, lot of all kinds of hack, all kinds of spaghetti code was there. Actually, you know, nobody understood what these algorithms did. Uh, and okay, so that turned out to be uh, a plus point, actually, because at least our algorithm, they could understand what they did. And you know, later it turned out to be really crucial. But we had to go back to the drawing board. And we said, OK, what's, uh, what's happening? So the algorithm is not reactive enough. Even with this doubling trick, um, it's very hard to solve these big LPs you know, very fast. So the algorithm was slow to react to changes in the input. And the, the assumption that we made, for instance, that the distribution is stationary, both the IID and the random uh, order models are essentially the same assumption. This is not true. There are seasonalities. There are weekly, monthly, yearly you know, seasonalities that was not captured here. By the way, the title of uh, this slide is a pun. It refers to two things. One, it refers to the process we went through in uh, you know, having a model and algorithms going, talking to the engineers, and then seeing what the algorithm did, come back, redesign. Uh, so we did a couple of you know, iterations of this. I'm skipping the iterations and directly going to the final algorithm that we shipped. Um, but it also refers to the algorithm that we designed eventually, which is um, continuously update these duals. So the duals are learning continuously. And as a result, you know, we could show that they converge faster. And they're better able to adapt to changes in the input distribution. The dual update rule is really simple. Uh, this is a simplified version that we used in practice. The actual you know, things about which we prove theorems is uh, slightly more complicated, you know, but uh, it's the same in spirit. What it tries to do is it tries to keep the spin along a straight line. You know, starting, you should start from zero, you should go to your budget in a straight line as time progresses. And it uh, tries to adjust it. So what is this doing? So in any one time period, if you spend more than this ideal rate, it increases your alpha. And if you go back to the uh, formula, this decreases your effective bid, so you get less in the future, because you got more now. And vice versa, if you got less now, this makes you get more in the future. So it's intuitive, but uh, it took some work to show that this actually works, and it works better than uh, before. Uh, we shaved off this factor of n from the denominator, which is a big deal. Uh, so we got this convergence rate of epsilon squared by log n, which is also the optimal convergence rate under this assumption. Do you assume such a narrative of some sort for this result? So this, yeah, so I'll tell you. So this is for uh, uh, a priori. This is for IID. So uh, that's exactly my next slide. We also change the model to uh, take care of the seasonalities. And we call it uh, adversarial stochastic input, may not be the best name I've come up with. And uh, what we allow is a different distribution in each time step. So at first thought, this might look too strong, right? This is as bad as worst case. So we have to make some restrictions. 
and uh, we make one of two kinds of restrictions. So first restriction, the first restriction is that all the distributions are benign, which means that uh, the optimum value, if you had used this distribution throughout, should be high enough. So this is our notion of a benign distribution. And as long as the dt was uh, benign, you can change arbitrarily in each time step. So that's the first assumption under which this works. The second assumption is that we know something about these distributions. So in particular, we know the expected consumption rate. So think of you know if, if an optimum algorithm knew everything and tried to allocate optimally, what would be the expectation consumption, expected consumption for every advertiser over time? Uh, so the better you know, estimate you have of this, the better your algorithm is going to be. And uh, this can be estimated also from historic data. So you can look at the historic data, you can look at the seasonalities, you can project it, and you, know, you can try to solve big LPs and get some estimate of this. And uh, so the special case of this is IIT when the distributions don't change. But this is what really uh, is, is really useful. So we went back to the engineers. And this time, the algorithm worked. It worked really well. It worked much better than any other algorithm. And it was simple. So they could understand the algorithm. They, could, they knew what the algorithm is supposed to do. So when the algorithm did something funny, they caught it. And there would be a bug most of the time. So, and then they could also fine tune. They could make tweaks. And they could fine tune to take care of all kinds of corner cases not covered by the theory. And in, in short, they loved it. And um, it was used at Microsoft for a few years to run the display ad system. Until recently, Microsoft sold the whole business to AOL. I don't know what happened then. <laughs> so uh, here is there's a, some recency bias in the algorithm? <laughs> no, so the, you know, the bias is introduced through the uh, consumption rates. So as I said earlier, I track the algorithm. It tries to keep the rate of consumption and the straight line. Instead of the straight line, you can give it any curve, and it tries to track to that curve. Okay, so you still assume that uh, last year fall is so that So the algorithm, it's not part of the algorithm. Right. The way to think of it is, yeah. it's part of how you estimate this, the CATs. Yeah, yeah. So however you do it, if there are biases in that, there are biases in the algorithm if there aren't. So it's, it's kind of modular. So, okay. so you don't have an agnostic algorithm that in principle, you could learn, like, if, you know, if it doesn't change arbitrarily fast, you would hope that you could track the... So you're, you're proposing a different model. That's not what this model is. And you know, people have tried to do th th those kind of things. Not that successful in doing that. I want to go back to a theory a little bit. Um, when people saw our algorithm, or even the earlier the MSCV algorithm, because it's you know doing this multiplicative update of the duals, uh, everybody said, "Oh, look! Oh, it's related to this multiplicative update algorithm that's used to solve the experts' problem." But until very recently, we didn't have any formal connection. Uh, by the way, if you don't know what the experts' problem is, it's one of the most uh, celebrated, most used problems in uh, machine learning. Uh, that's that's the machine learning there. <laughs> what it uh, what it says is. OK, there are, you know, it's also an online problem. In every round, the algorithm has to pick one out of n experts. And after, you know, think of this as stock picks, you have to follow one of the experts. And after you've picked, you see the reward of each expert. Uh, and, then, and then you can kind of uh, change your strategy and pick a different expert. And these algorithms uh, have this kind of a guarantee that the reward of the algorithm is almost as good as the reward of the best expert on hindsight. So there is, it's actually not no regret, there is some regret. But the regret is small. And what we showed was that it's not necessarily this multiplicative update algorithm or anything. Uh, we could use a black box access to an algorithm that solves experts. So any algorithm you design to solve this, we could use it as a black box to solve the online budgeted allocation or any of these packing problems. So how does it work? The expert's algorithm has to pick some probability. So usually the expert's algorithm is randomized. So it has a probability of picking each expert. And we take these probabilities, and we normalize it, and we get the dual variables. So our advertisers map to experts. 
and then now I have to run the experts algorithm, so I need rewards, right? What what reward rewards are the experts got? And the rewards are essentially this: it's this uh, actual spend minus the ideal spend. Okay, so that's the reward I feed back, and then you know this loop continues. And you know again, this should look uh, familiar to the algorithm what we saw earlier. If you actually use the multiplicative weight update algorithm for the experts, then the algorithm I showed earlier is exactly what you would get. So it's related in that way. So, sorry, what is T over here in the bottom there? So T is the total uh, number of uh, impressions or queries that you're going to get. So this is the, you know, this is that, lay, that line, the slope of that line uh, that you, you spend, you know, at the constant rate. So in practice, there's no T. So in practice, okay, so this you would replace it with uh, CAT. So I'm just showing it for the IID case. So you replace it with CAT, that's it. So this is the ideal spend. Uh, so you take the actual spend minus the ideal spend. So finally, so we showed that, you know, this kind of a, you know, algorithm gets the same optimal convergence rate. And uh, what more, uh, using this perspective, we could solve more problems. So I said the, the problem I showed, the display ad allocation problem, is very close to the actual problem, but there are always some gaps. Uh, for instance, so because this is guaranteed delivery, it's related to the question you asked, there are under delivery penalties. So that's why I just put a less than equal to. So if you deliver less, there's a penalty, and the way you incorporate this is that penalty goes into the objective function. Except that penalty is nonlinear. And the problems we could solve earlier were all linear. So it was really kind of, you know, it needed some hack to uh, incorporate this nonlinear into that framework earlier. But now with this new algorithm, we can solve uh, these uh, nonlinear uh, objective functions. Other uh, examples are advertisers, uh, they require this mixture of impressions, uh, even though, so they may say, okay, you know, everyone is fine, but I want equal number of men and women, or maybe I want close to equal. I want uh, equal spread of different kind of uh, geographical locations and so on. And uh, you have typically different objectives. You have revenue, you have relevance, and you have other things. And uh, okay, one thing to do is just combine them linearly. That's fine. You, you, know, you get a linear objective. But you might want to combine them in a nonlinear way uh, for various reasons. So all these can be modeled as either a concave objective function or as a convex constraint. And uh, this new algorithm that uses this no regret learning can uh, solve all of this. So can solve, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the problems we can solve in theory are much closer to what occur in practice now. Just. Many other generalizations, yeah. What's the online uh, learning algorithm which leads to? So it's a black box. So it's it. So now you need online convex optimization. So my question is, if you go back to the original problem and take Devan or his algorithm. Do you know what? Uh... So Devno Hayes is not. It's not that. It's it's the other one. The third one that I talked about with uh, you know the continuous learning algorithm. So that corresponds to really the multiplicative update algorithm. And people have considered many other generalizations. This is a biased sample of the kind of things people have looked at. Uh, when you show when you show multiple uh, ads on the page, you have combinatorial constraints. For instance, uh, you cannot show both Pepsi and Coke ad on the same page at the same time. And people have considered this. Um, there have been many attempts to mix worst case guarantees and stochastic guarantees, you know, kind of maybe like what you were suggesting. Um, and people have considered, like for instance, I mentioned there are multiple objectives, and uh, you know, one way to do is just combine them into one objective. But you might want simultaneous guarantees for each of these objectives. So people have considered that also. And then there's game theory, right? Uh, so initially, we got rid of game theory. But for a lot of these auctions, uh, like search auctions or auctions, even display ad auctions that are sold on an exchange, each allocation is done via an auction. So the game theory is inherent. And in uh, the rest of the time, I want to talk about how people have tried to bring game theory back into this online allocation and where we are in, 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 in that uh, direction. The first thing I want to talk about is this thing called a fluid mean field equilibria. Uh, I don't understand all the terms, but I, I, I have a good idea of what this means. I'll tell you in a minute. So think of display ad exchanges. So this is, again, uh, display ads. 
but each impression is sold on an exchange. It's sold as a second price auction. Okay. Now I want to understand what uh, the bidders in this auction that have this long-term constraints. So they could have capacity constraints or they could have budget constraints. What their strategies are, what they should do. And I'm going to restrict this strategy to a, a bid function. So what this uh, does is it takes a value for that impression and it maps to a uh, bid, right? So this is a stationary strategy. So this does not depend on how much time is left in the day or how much budget is left or any such thing. So it's, it's a stationary strategy. Suppose I fix a, such a strategy for each bidder. Then now each bidder can look at all the other bidders and look at what the competition is. So this is called the bid landscape. So for every you know, possible impression, you know, what is the highest other bid? when I apply the, this bid function and to the value, whatever values the competitors have. So this gives me some bid landscape. Okay, so you know, it's easy to go from bid functions to bid landscapes. Now, an equilibrium is, given the bid landscape, this must be a best response for that addresser. So it must maximize its own utility subject to his budget constraint. Right? So this is the equilibrium. So this is what this fluid mean field equilibrium is. Okay, so this is you know this is a game between advertisers or bidders, and this is uh, an equilibrium in this game. It's not clear such an equilibrium exists because I fixed the strategy to be stationary, but actually they showed that such a, an equilibrium exists, and this optimal strategy, this, the equilibrium strategy, looks something familiar, something like what we've been talking you know, uh, for the last 30 minutes. It takes a value and it hits it with a discount factor. Um, so a similar kind of a bid lowering uh, equilibrium in search ad actions was also, uh, you know, uh, proposed by uh, Arenek and uh, co-authors. But this is one example of the kind of analysis that people have done trying to understand the game genetic aspects. So we did a similar thing for search ads. Now in search ads, the default contract is that you cannot change the bids. The bids are what they are. So if you have the advertiser participate in an auction, you have to use the bid he gave. You cannot change. So this kind of bid lowering is by default, unless the advertiser allows you to change his bid, you cannot do it. So all you can do as a search engine is you can take the advertiser selectively out of the auction. And you want to do this you know, essentially because you have to do the budget management. If you just put him in all the auctions, and he will exhaust his budget too soon, and he will not be happy. This is called throttling. Okay, so now the question is, which auction should you put him in? Which auction should you take him out of? And here again, you can think of this as a game between the advertisers. And now the strategies are not bids. The strategies, the bids are, somehow, are kind of fixed. The strategies are whether he wants to be in the auction or not. And here, if you look at threshold strategies. So what this means is every advertiser has a threshold, theta a, and he will participate in the auction if and only if his ROI, the return on investment, which is the ratio of his value to the price he pays, is at least this threshold. Actually, it's not clear uh, that this is even well defined. Uh, what we show is if you fix the thresholds upfront, then there is a way for every auction to kind of find a subset of addresses such that everyone uh, satisfies this threshold property simultaneously. So this is not trivial, uh, it needs some work, but these threshold strategies are well defined. And then again, you do the same thing. So once you fix these strategies, you get some sense of what the competition is, because you apply this to everyone and then you see the competition. And now this must be a best response given the competition. So it's a very similar idea. Again, so this is a notion of equilibrium for this game between advertisers. And what we show is equilibrium exists. And we also propose some heuristics uh, using essentially the same kind of update rule that we use for the, uh, the continuous learning algorithm, like the multiplicative update. And this seems to do well in, um, in practice. We ran experiments. It converges fast. Uh, but still, for this, we don't know. In theory, we can't prove if it actually converges to an equilibrium. So the, these two are examples where we are fixing the way 
an individual impression or a query is allocated using an auction, like you know, using either the second price or the GSP auction. But you can also consider the end-to-end -end problem as one mechanism design problem. It's a dynamic or online mechanism design problem. But it's slightly different from the usual type of uh, mechanism, dynamic mechanism design problem studied, because here, so the advertisers are all present. The bidders are all present in the beginning. They submit their type, their entire type is submitted at the beginning. So there's no extensive form game or anything. So it's a direct revelation mechanism. So it's not dynamic in that sense. What is dynamic or online is the supply. So you don't know what you can sell. And the supply is coming online. You have to allocate the items as and when they come. And you may charge a payment at the end, or you may ask the payment also to be charged online. Both models have been considered. And there are multiple papers that have looked at a single item, but there are multiple copies of this item. You don't know how many copies are going to come. But as a copy comes, you have to allocate it immediately. If you want to maximize welfare, uh, it's actually very easy if you can charge at the end, because you can implement the VCG. But if you want to maximize welfare while charging also immediately, then there's this paper that showed how to get a log n approximation. And uh, you can't do anything better than log log n. If you want to maximize revenue, then you really need to uh, charge at the end, and you can get a constant approximation. There's this other uh, th example where you have budget constraints. If you have additive valuations. You can get as many items as you want, but you don't want to pay more than a certain amount. And in this case, in the offline setting, there is this uh, nice uh, Pareto optimal auction that uh, generalizes Asubel's uh, adaptive clinching auction. And uh, this guy showed that actually you can implement this online, even when you don't know the supply. So you can you know, allocate and charge payments online. So all this was for a single item. Now, what happens if you have two items? Okay. So suppose there are two bidders. There are two items. So they submit the bids for both the items ahead of time. Item one arrives, always. You're going to get item one. You have to allocate it to someone. And then item two may or may not arrive. You don't know. So you have to allocate item one without knowing whether item two is going to come or not. But the payment you can charge later when you figure out whether item two came or not. And you want to maximize welfare. Now what approximation you can get if you insist on a truthful auction? But truthful, I mean you have to be truthful in dominant strategy no matter what. And let's say deterministic mechanism. So any guesses? Just two items. Half water. You cannot get any bounded factor, even for this case. Even for this very kind of the only uncertainty is whether the item two comes or not. No truthful mechanism can get any bounded factor. Just with two items, two bidders. Is this with the capacity constraint of the bidders? Or? Bidders are unit demand. Sorry. Yeah. Each bidder wants only one item. So you might think, okay, the, you know, you can get n, n squared, e to the n. You know, here there is no n, right? It's just a, a, a you know, fixed size. Still, you cannot get any approximation. That should strike you as very surprising. It, it, it so did to us. Algorithm can get easily factor of two. Randomized algorithm can get factor n. Yeah, it can get factor two. But if you insist on deterministic, then you cannot get any finite approximation. And the reason for that is, if you also insist that you always allocate both items, you cannot throw items away, which is a reasonable thing to expect, actually. But if you insist on this, then there is no truthful mechanism, period. Okay. And if you don't insist on this, then the truthfulness constraint, what it imposes is that it makes you throw away items, even when the items are of very high value. And because of that, you get an unbounded factor. And so this is a joint work with uh, Sir Kenneth and Sivan. 
we just uploaded this paper in archive last week. So if you're interested, you can take a look. So to summarize, in the non-game theoretic setting where you have a pure online optimization problem, we understand very well what to do. You know, we have this thing of uh, dual base allocations, you know, give it to the highest discounted bidder. We know how to learn these duals from history uh, and how to update these duals as you go along, and these have been very successfully used in practice. When it comes to incorporating the game theoretic part, then one thing that people have done to some degree of success is you fix the auction format and you try to understand the equilibrium uh, in the game between the advertisers. There are these two uh, strategies, either you lower the bids or you throttle them out. But if you insist on a truthful mechanism end to end, then you run into very strong impossibilities very fast. But even then, I want to say there is a very interesting open problem of whether you can get any truthful mechanism that is asymptotically optimal in some stochastic settings. What are the suitable assumptions that allow you to get something that's asymptotically optimal? And such a positive result would have uh, you know, great practical value too. So with that, I want to end. Thank you. So if you change to a Bayesian perspective, I mean the last infinite infinity result. Yeah. So, so even Bayesian, it it's potentially we could do, but we don't know any finite approximation even in the Bayesian case. But why don't you like uh, randomized mechanisms? No, no, I you know it's fine. It's still okay. So randomized mechanisms. So what this shows is you need some source of randomization. Either the mechanism must be randomized or the values must be randomized, or the input must be randomized. So you, if, you know, now the, there are three directions you can take this. All three of them are interesting. For randomized mechanisms, we know a minimum of m comma n, where m is the number of items and n is the number of advertisers. We don't know anything better. This is terrible, right? So what I mean by Bayesian is that uh, if you do the solve for the optimal Bayesian mechanism, it may not be you know, very good in the worst case, but then it will, you can do it in a truthful way. So Bayesian, if you, so even Bayesian, if you want it to be truthful in the online sense, that you want it to be truthful when only item one arrives, and you want it to be truthful only when both item arrives. You know, the truthful can be in expectation over the values, but in the item arrival, it has to be always truthful. We don't know anything. So that's, so this, this are three interesting directions here the Bayesian, the randomized, and when the input is, you know, in, uh, is stochastic. Any of these three notion, you know, uh, sources of randomness could help. We don't know how much it helps. In the, uh, in the algorithmic settings so of the first half of your talk, <coughs> are there any models of people that worked with where the value of, let's say, a click depends on the price that I'm paying, because there's often this worry that, that, that if I bid a low number, then I only buy the stuff that nobody else wants to buy, and if, as I, I submit higher bids, I also get some higher value things. And a lot of the models I see ignore this and ignore that the value per click is independent of the price of the Yeah, bid. so this is like the common value, interdependent values, I think. It's interdependent value, maybe. Varies because a, a so people have, problem. yeah, people have studied this in the offline setting, just looking at one auction, but uh, I haven't seen anything that uh, incorporate, incorporates this into the online setting. Thanks again. Thanks.